This episode of the Arkham Sessions, I think we have to dedicate to the late, great Bob Hastings, mm -hmm. who Batman the Animated Series fans certainly know as Commissioner Jim Gordon. Actually, in my day job as a special features producer, Bob was one of the first people that I got to interview over at Shout Factory. Um, he was a cast member of a TV show called McHale's Navy. Mm -hmm. Uh, with Ernest Borgnine and Tim Conway, Carl Ballantyne, and, and, and we reunited many of the members of the cast, including Bob Hastings, and he couldn't have been a sweeter gentleman. Devastating to hear um, that one of the sweetest men I've had an opportunity to interact with has passed away. No matter when it happened, he would have been too young. Yeah. We're going to go ahead and dedicate this episode of the Arkham Sessions to Mr. Bob Hastings. Welcome to another episode of the Arkham Sessions, brought to you by Comics Alliance. I am Brian Ward, and as always, I am joined by... Dr. Andrea Letamendi. This is the podcast that analyzes every episode of Batman the Animated Series from a, a different point of view, and that is the psychological point of view, and Dr. Letamendi is here to do that. Hello, Andrea. How are you? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm doing well. Actually, I'm very, very excited. We had a great day. We visited the um, Warner Brothers Studios and we took a tour of uh, many things, but one exceptional, um, very, I would say, special exhibit was the Batman exhibit. Yeah, they're celebrating the 75th anniversary of Batman over at Warner Brothers Studios. Uh, I highly recommend if anyone is in the Southern California area, you should absolutely pay for the ticket to get a VIP tour because then you'll be allowed to go into the museum there. Uh, and the whole bottom floor of the museum is dedicated to Batman uh, on film from the 89 uh, film all the way up to the most recent uh, Nolan trilogy. Uh, it is quite a sight to behold. Costumes, props, you name it, it's all there. Very well done. Very well done, very awesome. Uh, and then they had an entirely different exhibit there at the studios. Um, all of the Batmobiles. Just about any Bat vehicle you could think of. Yeah. Except for Batman uh, and Robin. The Batmobile for Batman and Robin. Yeah, there. but who really wants to see that one? Not me. Mm. They had the 89 Batman Batmobile. And for me, that's enough. That is my Batmobile. Well, of course, my Batmobile is the animated series Batmobile, and they can't have they that one. They did not have that one. And last week, we had a pretty fantastic week, uh, particularly with interactions. We had a lot of people responding to the OCD versus OCPD. A lot of people really seem to like your take on uh, the Clock King mm -hmm. and his struggle, uh, if you can call it that, with OCPD. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess really it would be the the rest of the world's struggle with the Clock King's OCPD mm -hmm. uh, more than anything else. Right. But a lot of people seem to, to dig that. Um, I will say, though, we did have someone come to us on Twitter, at Arkham Sessions. Scott McClellan over at Twitter uh, actually said, I respectfully disagree regarding Clock King. As a child viewer, I was very sympathetic slash empathetic on his very bad day. I was sad and upset for him watching that scene. Okay. Temple Fugit is having the worst day of his life. Right. Well, he takes um, he takes Mayor Hill's advice, and he decides to change one little minor thing in his schedule, which for him was very difficult to do, but he, he decided to do it. And it ruined his entire day, and in fact, it also it, it changed his life entirely. And one of the things we're, we were talking about in the last episode was the writer... David Wise had said that he kind of liked the idea of screwing with someone's schedule mm -hmm. when they were so rigid with it. Like he, he kind of enjoyed. We we got we as an audience got this sort of perverse 
enjoyment or pleasure out of watching Temple Fugit's uh, entire world come crumbling yeah. down. Well, I, I want to say a couple things. One is that I remember watching this when I was young, and I did feel sympathetic for him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that it depends on what kind of child you were growing up, but I think many young people may have felt sympathetic because... Uh, that's just a natural response. Right. That, and we're not really, as, as children, we're not really used to, to coming across uh, people with OCPD. Um, of course, David Wise did as he, was, um, as he was in school. But there is this sense, I think, when you are young, that you're more prone to feeling sympathetic. And I do remember experiencing that. And I was a rather perfectionistic youth, so I, I felt that I related to him. As you grow older, though, we do start to see a lot more people that start to annoy us. Uh, (laughs) Right. And and not because of their mental disorder or, uh, or, or behavioral disorder or, you know, personality disorder or whatever. It's because they're so pompous. It's because they are so arrogant. It is because it, their way is the best way and the only way. Mm -hmm. And you want to see those people taken down. And I think that's what David was talking about. That's what we were talking about. Right. Is, is you, you get a guy like that and you just want to see him fail. Right. And I can understand that. Um, but, you know, at the end of the episode, we also talked about the um, the response we have when we interact with people who truly do have these very rigid personality styles, whether from OCPD or OCD or Asperger's or what was formerly called Asperger's. And I mentioned that when we have those initial reactions of wanting to distance ourselves, not liking the person. I mean, those are essentially reactions that um, are not, I would say they're not quite understanding. They're natural and I think they're expected because that person is quote unquote so difficult and anal and rigid that just as human beings, we have a, a difficulty with dealing with them. But again, as we concluded at the end of that episode, even if we have some level of distaste for that personality trait, there is some, we, we can extend some compassion to, to that person when we understand that, well, really what they're doing is they're trying to find order and trying to find predictability in a world that they do not find um, safe. It's almost like I agree with what this listener is saying, but I also... <clears throat> disagree in that, well, we weren't saying that we wanted something terrible to happen to this person. We were saying we felt these feelings. We Very felt, real human yeah. feelings of, of wanting to see them taken down a peg. Yes. But then with your, uh, your description of what's actually going on, we then find ourselves empathizing or at totally. least sympathizing for this person who is trying to find order in an otherwise chaotic world. Yeah, absolutely. Drea, you also had an email uh, come up from last week as well, right? I did. I received an email on underthemaskonline.com, which is where people can submit uh, comments or questions. And someone by the name of Graham wrote me um, a really interesting email explaining his take on episode 23, which uh, was Fear of Victory. Oh, yeah. Um, So remember that one when Batman um, sort of coached Robin through his anxiety and helped Robin over overcome his panic attacks. Um, Going up against the scarecrow. Yeah. So I just want to read a little bit of this email and talk about how performance anxiety was one particular, I guess, perspective of that episode. Um, so the message says, I've been listening to your shows for a while now. Thank you, Graham. We appreciate that. Um, and then goes on to say they had a different opinion of the assessment of episode 23, Fear of Victory. Graham says, you looked at the episode from the perspective that Scarecrow created a poison that led to a phobia like anxiety. You advised the face your fear approach, uh, agreeing with Batman's you've got to fight it, regain control speech. However, I think a more appropriate interpretation would be that of performance anxiety, one where the fear is less about the act, but the effects of failure. All the people affected were athletes. Our star quarterback was even pushing to get drafted. The difference to many may seem subtle, but the treatment would be very different, as you will no doubt know. Um, And so then this uh, this listener goes on to to talk about Sven Goran Eriksson, an international soccer coach. Have Mm -hmm. you heard of this person? Mm -hmm. Um, 
who talks about not using uh, the words we must or you've got to, instead using you can, you will, right. more encouraging words. Um, and so Graham says, I feel Batman's advice was similar to that of the public who think when athletes don't perform, it's because they didn't try enough. When in many cases, they have just went too far to the right on the inverted U curve. Okay. Now, I'm not a sports person. Maybe you understand what that means. Right, right. Um, and, and Graham says, uh, being a retired athlete, this email is less about disagreeing, but more to raise awareness of something that many coaches and parents do not fully understand. Again, I agree and disagree with Graham in a couple of ways. Mm-hmm. Graham brings up performance anxiety. And we didn't really go into performance anxiety when we talked about fear of victory. But performance anxiety is essentially this very common... Uh, fear, it, it's usually called stage fright, of doing something in front of people. And as the email says, of course, many athletes experience performance anxiety, but public speakers experience performance anxiety, actors do. It's probably one of the most common uh, experiences of anxiety uh, overall. Research shows that about 40% of people at some point will have some kind of performance anxiety. So it's really not categorized as a mental illness. It's more of this kind of common experience that people have. That low? 40%? Well, only, only, I mean, of all the people who stand on a stage and deliver yeah. a speech, of all the people who go on stage and deliver dialogue for a play, of all the people who well, go out 40%. and play sports, only 40% of the 100% population? Do you think population? that's low? I think it's incredibly low. Well, I think the majority of people in the world who have to do something performance mm-hmm. driven, I, I feel like most of them will at some point in time experience performance anxiety. Yeah. I, I can't imagine it being that low. Nonetheless, I do want to clarify that what we interpreted uh, in that episode with Batman essentially coaching Robin through, pushing through his panic attack is not, I think, is not so much someone saying, you know, just get over it, um, just get through it, you know, kind of that dismissive um, dismissive type of advice that actually, I worked with anxiety disorders for the majority of my career. So, mm-hmm. so the most common thing people will hear from family members and relatives and friends is, you know, just get over it, just stop overthinking it, just, you know, don't, don't worry about it. And it's very dismissive because in fact, it is debilitating um, you can't stop worrying about it. And it is both a physical, emotional, and cognitive process. So it's it's really impossible to just get over it, so to speak. So I just want to say that I in no way meant that Batman or that we were saying, hey, this is an effective method, just get over it. What Batman was actually doing was more akin to what we call exposure therapy, or at least the Batman animated series version of exposure therapy, which is you have a coach with you advising and guiding you through something very challenging that produces anxiety and you're being told you can do it you've got to get through it and batman does does use words i I think he says um you've you've got to get through this but we didn't see that as being dismissive or forcing him through the anxiety but what we see is batman being supportive encouraging and essentially guiding robin through a difficult time and yes he's telling him you do have to face your fear but that's part of the exposure therapy. You do not avoid the situation that produces the anxiety. You do not avoid the feelings of anxiety. You have to withstand it. And if you do it in a way that's safe and supportive in the way that Batman suggested, um, you know, then it can be an effective method to overcome the anxiety. So I would say that if Batman were dismissive or if he sort of forced him to do it, then, you know, maybe we wouldn't have been in agreement with Batman's choice, but I think that the way that he um, presented his support was more like an exposure therapy session than uh, someone just being dismissive of Robin's anxiety. Two things. One, I do agree with him. And two, I disagree with him. Uh, In that, as a former athlete myself, uh, I definitely understand performance anxiety. We refer to it as choking. If you're in the big game, even if you're a star athlete, If suddenly the pressure is on, the thing that you normally excel in doing, suddenly the pressure gets to you and you choke. You can't can't win the big game. No Mm -hmm. matter how many other games you can win, you can't win this big game. You can uh, basically just convince yourself that you're not good enough. I have to say that this episode didn't look into that. 
we weren't talking about star athletes that were under pressure, um, that were forcing themselves into this. We were talking about the Scarecrow's powder, which actually was adrenaline activated. So the adrenaline is actually, you know, these star athletes who would have otherwise been excelling with this flow of adrenaline and, you know, like they were in their element. They weren't suffering from stage fright. They weren't right. suffering from anxiety. They were actually ready to win these games. They yeah. were. They should have won these games. And well, it was basically producing a panic attack um, by creating those physiological symptoms that right. we reviewed in that episode. Right, but this wasn't a naturally occurring thing. So um, I would say, yes, you're absolutely right in that if we had been dealing with naturally occurring panic attacks or or moments of choking on the field, then I would say maybe the coach coming up to them and saying, look, you got to get over it, isn't the best possible way to do it. But, you know, I, I, I think it's a, a fascinating email. Um, I do find myself in agreement and I find myself in disagreement. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but that's what Batman the Animated Series uh, has been doing up to this point. Making us argue. Making us argue. So let's get to it. This episode, we are dealing with Appointment in Crime Alley. Uh, it was written by Jerry Conway. It was adapted by a 1970s comic mm -hmm. story by uh, the great Denny O'Neill, who did a, a fantastic run on Batman. And who I think has a, a very nice psychological insight on, on Batman. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, in fact, I would say that this particular episode is really just a psychological take mm -hmm. on Batman yeah. and his current state. And I think that Jerry Conway did a fantastic job of adapting it for ostensibly a children's animated yeah. series. Yeah. But we, we are interacting with our old foe, Roland Daggett, who people would remember in the uh, the episode with Clayface. Yeah, he essentially created Clayface. Yeah, created the the chemical that uh, that uh, Clayface had been using, um, OD'd on. Yeah. You know, when his men shoved it down his throat, and he became Clayface. Uh, so we certainly know that this guy as an unscru unscrupulous businessman, and uh, he is certainly up to those old tricks here in this episode where we learn that he essentially wants to blow up crime alley park row yeah uh, and he wants to do it under the guise of a gas leak uh, and so he is hired an arsonist by the name of nitro and i can explosives on my business to uh, rig up this gas leak, and he basically wants to destroy all of Crime Alley so mm -hmm. that he can then build it up into a mini mall and mm -hmm. into, you know, he wants to use this land to create uh, very expensive real estate. Because obviously, since the death of the Waynes, Crime Alley has just become decrepit. Right. So we learned that, that uh, Park Avenue 30 years ago was this well to do neighborhood. Um, very safe, uh, wealthy families and, and uh, citizens there. And over the last 30 years has completely, basically it's become the slums. Right. And um, some people still live there. We, we meet a few of the residents of what's now called Park Row or Crime Alley. And Dr. Leslie Tompkins is one of the residents who's lived there from the beginning and um, essentially, it's, it sounds as though this is her home. She has no intention to leave. I've lived in Park Row for 30 years. It's my home. I'm not afraid here. She's a medical doctor. Dr. Leslie Tompkins is fairly well known in the Batman universe. Mm -hmm. And uh, with most versions of this character, she is a medical doctor who consoles uh, Bruce Wayne, as you mentioned, after the death of his parents. She went to medical school with Thomas Wayne mm -hmm. and was close with the family, so she's considered a family friend, and that she had some, um, had a very important relationship with Bruce in helping him overcome the, this huge trauma that he experienced as a child. Yeah, he's, she is one of the, the few people who knows Batman's secret. Right. And, uh, at 9 p.m., that block is going to come down. It's, yeah. it's just going to go up in flames. Well, now, he has the courtesy of letting the 
the folks know who live in that neighborhood to vacate. So uh, apparently uh, people have gotten these notices or these threats, actually. Threats, yeah. To leave their homes. Lady, you and your kid were told to clear out. We have essentially a crime boss. And we see that this guy is actually good enough to send his goons yeah. to essentially throw these people out. Tell them to leave. You know, without actually telling them what's going to happen, mm -hmm. they are making sure they aren't on the street when this place blows up. Right. Uh, later we see that, that in fact, some of these people have not left. And Daggett, eh, isn't that bent up over it? He, right. To him, it's sort of like, well, we tried. Unlike other villains we've seen, like the Joker and even the Scarecrow, who want to... Uh, cause harm to people it, Daggett's more like uh, he's about the power he he wants to uh, you know to wipe the slums and and create this uh, this high end he wants to bring it back to what it used to be so he's more interested in the power and the success of that he's not interested in causing harm to people he does look down upon those those citizens that live in in crime alley and he he does talk about wanting to clean uh, the area in short we cannot allow the underclass to hinder us from building a better tomorrow. So there is sure. this this sort of interesting class um, sort of commentary here. Well, and, and then that's when we're introduced to Dr. Tompkins. She stumbles across Daggett's plan. She actually witnesses Nitro and uh, Crocker, who is voiced by the great Jeffrey Tambor, uh, in the middle of the act. What are you doing here? And uh, she is taken prisoner because obviously she has found them. She knows exactly who they are. She knows right. exactly who they work for. They can't let her leave. So they tie her up and, uh, and keep her there in the building. Batman is set to meet with her as he does every year. And he notices that she's not there. And uh, so he goes looking for her and is told that, uh, that she left a while ago. I told her to be careful. Bad things happen to people in Crime Alley. He then goes to her home. And this is where we really learn about her backstory. He goes into her apartment and there we find in a book a collection of newspaper clippings. And we get the sense that she has got a long history with the Wayne family. We see that she takes the article about the Wayne's murder, and she has kept that. Uh, we see that she was there to comfort Bruce. Someone is spying on Batman. Uh, or maybe not even on Batman, but on Dr. Tompkins' uh, home. And he seems to sympathize. Poor Doc Tompkins. She's in trouble. Batman catches him and finds out that this man witnessed her being abducted. Mm -hmm. And uh, Batman goes to find Nitro and does. Finds uh, Dr. Tompkins tied up to a chair. Yeah. She says not to bother with her. They're blowing up the old SRO hotel. You've got to get the people out. So Batman disarms the bomb there uh, at, at the building where she is. And uh, then he goes right for the hotel SRO disarms that bomb just in time as all the other buildings on Crime Alley blow up. Mm -hmm. All of this is happening while Roland Daggett is giving a, a, a big speech, a big like sort of hoorah speech to uh, the Gotham City BBC. Gentlemen, Gotham City is at a crossroads. In this speech, he says something that I find extremely uh, telling. Are we for progress or against it? For the future or for the past? Let's talk about this. Daggett wants to proceed. Uh, despite the quality of man that Daggett is, he wants to build Crime Alley up. Yeah. He wants to take this place that is violent and, and on its last legs, and he wants to make it... A, uh, a prosperous center of the community once again. Right. Well, and underlying that goal would be the idea of 
Crime Alley no longer being Crime Alley, that it would be safer, Correct. that it would be profitable, that Correct. it would, you know, create jobs. You know, like, I, I, I see where you're going here, where this isn't so much a bad idea. Yeah, it, it really doesn't seem like a bad idea. He's going through very bad ways of getting there, but it seems like the kind of thing that a philanthropist would have done. Why do you have to blow up a town to, uh, to put up a mini mall? Well, so here's the thing. Uh, one of our listeners, Bernard O'Shea, he actually had this exact same take on it that I did, which is Batman seems to be stuck in the past. He seems to be stuck within his grief. He -hmm. would rather Crime Alley remain a graveyard Mm -hmm. than uh, uh, become prosperous again. Mm -hmm. Think about it this way. Bruce Wayne and Wayne Enterprises could have built this place up a long time ago. Without having to blow it up. Without ever having to do anything illegally. would have taken care of all of the tenants there. This place could have been a place sure. uh, of community once again. Instead, Bruce Wayne and Batman have allowed this place to remain crime alley. Mm-hmm. Uh, and later on in the episode, we even see that his appointment with Dr. Tompkins is always to go lay two roses down in the place where Thomas and Martha were killed. There is certainly this sentimental, emotional attachment um, that that Bruce Wayne has to this area. And when we see this scene, it's the final scene, it sort of, it's, the, it, what, an end cap. It, it kind of... It explains what his appointment is. It also explains his relationship with Dr. Tompkins. And it explains some of what you're talking about, that Crime Alley continues to exist, and there seems to be some purpose for that. So it's actually a really great touching scene at the end where he kneels down on the ground and he puts two roses down. And there's this dialogue with Dr. Tompkins. This used to be a beautiful street. Good people lived here once. Good people still live in Crime Alley. Referring to her, and I think almost in a way referring to the memory of his parents as he lays down these roses. And, and Interesting. He's, he's kneeling there and she's, um, I noticed that she has, she also bends down and she has his arms around him. Mm-hmm. And uh, In the exact same way that she did in the photo of her uh, consoling young Bruce. Because it then dissolves from the newspaper that photo. Yeah that, that, yeah, that she is still, probably like she does every year, puts her arm around him. and, uh, and, and It's such an interesting kind of uh, gesture because he's not hugging her back. He doesn't console her. He doesn't put his arm around her. Even though we know that she's also missing uh, the Waynes. She was very close to mm-hmm. both of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, and she lost a lot too. Now certainly not as much as little Bruce did, but she did. She was friends with with that family. But once again, he he has sort of gone back to being that little boy. Yeah. He is, he is not an adult anymore. He's certainly not a crime fighter even anymore. Despite the fact that he's still wearing his Batman uniform, he is now sort of the little boy who's laying two roses down at his parents' gravesite. So. Uh, and she is putting her arm around him like she used to. And as much as I love that scene, and I think it's it's very fitting, and it it, it explains so much with very little dialogue, I also it, it a couple of things come to mind for me. One is is very similar to what you're saying, which is what would happen to Batman if if Crime Alley were were basically <clears throat> completely renovated, right. disappeared, and became something else? What would happen to him? Um, and the other question is, why is he in his Batman costume putting roses down on basically the site where Thomas and Martha Wayne were murdered? It is weird. I, I don't know that I would do that because, you know, someone might walk by and make the connection. So that's a little odd. She clearly knows who Batman is. Uh, so it, it seems like it wouldn't be a difficult task to go get out of uniform, become Bruce Wayne again. Yeah. And then go to the crime site I would be uh, looking over my down. shoulder, or look, sorry, looking over my cape, wondering, is anyone going to see me right now? Uh, but it's dark. It's in the middle of the night. Uh, it's much later. So... Well, one thing that I find interesting um, is that... So, several buildings did get blown up 
on this night. Batman was not able to defuse all the bombs, but the only buildings that came down were condemned buildings already. Right. There were no tenants in those buildings. Uh, so everyone got away uh, safely. Uh, unfortunately, Daggett also gets away because uh, his thugs are, are taken in, but uh, he makes it pretty clear uh, upon their being taken away that he's not going to take the fall for this. I'm shocked, shocked to learn that arson was the cause of this tragedy. Thank heaven the criminals responsible have been caught. Tompkins actually says, Let it go. Daggett won't escape the law forever. There's nothing you can do now. And besides, you have an appointment to keep. So even she is preventing the Batman from potentially going after someone that he may not catch anyway uh, for, for various legal reasons. Um, but even she seems to be stuck in this past yeah. where the Waynes were, were killed. She basically drags him to this spot. Uh, not drags him because I, I'm sure he goes very willingly. But she takes him away from his current mission to go to this... To, to the most haunting place in his memory. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and so I don't know if that makes her an enabler or if she too is stuck in the past, mm -hmm. but I, I found it very interesting that the two of them uh, were, were sort of stuck there. Well, I'll say this, going to the site where Thomas and Martha were, were murdered once a year, ostensibly on their anniversary to put down roses and, and to, to be consoled again by the one person that provided that social support that was very much needed when Bruce was a child is not unhealthy. So what their appointment means and symbolizes and, and that happening on a yearly basis is just by itself, that's not unhealthy. Um, so I guess I'm countering your point by saying, I don't mind that she takes him away from this distraction with Daggett and, and with his his uh, assistance and, and that whole bit because she knows that this is really important for him to commemorate the memory of his parents. And I would even go so far to say that somehow preserving Crime Alley or preserving at least this section of Crime Alley is important for Bruce because it's a reminder. It's a very, very real visceral reminder of what he's doing and what motivates him. And if he does that once a year, I can't really see the psychological harm in that. But you did mention something that was very interesting. You said that Batman, it seems like Batman is stuck. Mm -hmm. And in fact, people with anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, depression, and some of these mood disorders, in fact, we find that people actually are stuck. They're stuck with bad memories, bad feelings, and bad thoughts. That's kind of what keeps them depressed or anxious, or traumatized. This is very common with people who have PTSD. In fact, one of the most common treatments for PTSD is called cognitive processing therapy. And a huge component of that treatment is to identify what we call stuck points. So if something bad happened to you, a stuck point might be, I deserved that, I got what was coming to me, or I couldn't protect myself. So, you know, I used to work a lot with um, soldiers and veterans, and one of the most common stuck points was, I should have been stronger. Mm -hmm. I should have been able to save my friend, or I should have I should have done my job better. And so someone may have these, you know, be, basically be stuck in these beliefs and be unable to overcome those feelings that those beliefs cause. Like, okay. you know, depression, um, feeling anxious, feeling, you know, grief, feeling, you know, terrible guilt. That's what a stuck point is. Okay. People with depression also have stuck points. So they may have thoughts like, I'll never get out of this. I don't deserve any better. I'm unlovable. And of course, when you have those thoughts, you kind of get stuck in this cycle where those beliefs lead to negative feelings like sadness and, and even feelings or thoughts about ending one's life. And that leads to even more depression, right? So again, it's the cycle. So they can't just stop thinking about this thing. No, in fact, there was a recent research article in the Association for Psychological Science 
Um, and that article, you can actually find it online, the researcher said, folks with depression get stuck in a mindset where they relive what happened to them over and over again. Even though they think, okay, it's not helpful, I should stop thinking about this, I should just get on with my life, they can't stop doing it. So in fact, um, a number of uh, researchers ran this study where uh, participants with depression were recruited and sat in front of a computer, they did this computer task. And uh, participants were shown three words, one at a time for a second each. They were told to remember the words either in the order they were presented or backwards. So it's kind of like a memory test. Mm -hmm. The computer then presented one of the three words they saw, and they were supposed to respond as quickly as they could whether that word was first, second, or third in the list. So okay. it's a memory test, and then it's also remembering what position that word was in. Okay. The faster they were able to give a correct answer, the better they were at thinking flexibly. So when they compared the responses of folks with depression to folks without depression, they discovered that people with depression had trouble reordering the words in their head. If they were asked to remember the words in reverse order, they took longer to give the correct answer. And they had a particularly hard time if the three words had negative meanings like death or sadness. They found that people who had more trouble with this are also more likely to ruminate on their own troubles. So of course, that's just a quick computer task that shows maybe one kind of deficit uh, in folks with depression, but in particular, it shows that being able to get unstuck is, is difficult for them when compared to people without depression. So if you extend what we learned from that study to what we know about people who experience depression, you know, people saying things like, I can't stop thinking about that, I can't stop ruminating, all I think about are these sad thoughts, it actually makes sense. There is this neuropsychological component to depression, anxiety, and PTSD. That sense of being stuck in those thoughts isn't imagined, and it isn't like, woe is me, just feel sorry for me. It's a very, very real process. So, is Batman depressed? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, this this brings up a lot of issues with Batman because when you said he was stuck, I thought that it is quite possible that he is stuck in this cognitive process, that he's continuing to think about the death of his parents and why his parents were, were victimized in the way that they were and why he was victimized in the way that he was. And so there's a normal recovery process after a trauma like that where people, most people, will overcome it and still have a healthy memory of it. And yes, still visit the site of the accident or death or site of uh, the grave, but will not show signs of being stuck with the meaning of that event, which is kind of what we see with him. Now, I don't have enough information here to say he does or doesn't have PTSD or that he is or isn't depressed, um, but it is enough information to show that he does show the, the signs of being stuck. Okay. Well, I've got to tell you, uh, stuck or not, depressed uh, or not, I, I personally love this episode. I think it's a, a pretty great look at, uh, at, at the state of Batman, at the state of Bruce Wayne. Uh, I agree. Where he is. Uh, I very much enjoyed uh, meeting Dr. Tompkins. Uh, voiced, by the way, by Diana Moldauer, who uh, Star Trek fans would know as uh, Dr. Pulaski from uh, the second season of Star Trek The Next Generation. Hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely loving this episode. I think Jerry Conway did a fantastic job of adapting uh, such a, an emotionally uh, deep story. Yeah, it's worth watching. And I, I have to say, it really highlights that Bruce can be close with someone. He's... He has a relationship with Dr. Tompkins, and they've had this relationship for 30 years. So. He, can be, he can be close with someone at least once a year. And, <laughs> and one might suggest that this is just a, a further symptom of his OCPD, where uh, every year at this Ooh, time, at 9 o'clock sharp, <laughs> he has to visit Dr. Tompkins, and she has to go put her arm around him as they are laying down two roses on the sidewalk next to, you know, where his parents live. I can't argue or, against or, or, or this. Killed. I, I really, I can't, I don't have any evidence uh, on the contrary, so I, I can't disagree with you there. But uh, it's heartwarming. I, I do like it, and I do think that it's um, it's another great episode. And I think um, it, it, something for you Bat fans out there, uh, I noticed a couple of, of pretty great uh, little Easter eggs in, in this episode. 
the the place where she was being held captive was on the corner of Finger and Broom. Hmm. Uh, of course, Finger probably alluding to Bill Finger, the original writer co-creator of Batman. Who doesn't get enough credit? Never, never gets enough credit. They are working on that, and uh, and then uh, Broom, I'm presuming, is John Broom, who was also a DC writer. Hmm. Uh, you know, and and. Uh, at least I'm, I'm thinking so. So I'm thinking on the corner of Finger and Broom was uh, sort of a shout out to a couple of old DC hmm. uh, old timers. And, That's and great. I love seeing little things like that. Uh, this was a great episode. Thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, next week, we go into actually one of my favorite episodes, Mad as a Hatter. And, uh, obviously about the Scarecrow again. Obviously about the skin. <laughs> no. Uh, you come back... Listen to that episode. That is next week. Um, until then, we want to thank Comics Alliance for uh, sponsoring us. Uh, as always, you can find our episode two days earlier by visiting uh, comicsalliance.com. Um, otherwise, you can download us on iTunes or wherever you uh, pick up your, your podcast feeds. Um, you can also email us. We are arkhamsessions at gmail.com. You can also find us at underthemaskonline.com. That's- Thank you so much for the submissions and the emails lately. We really do enjoy getting them. Uh, you can also chat with us on Twitter. Absolutely. We are at Arkham Sessions. Drea, where can they find you on Twitter? I am at Arkham Asylum Doc. And I'm at Bward028. Uh, and uh, yeah, come back next week. Till then, I'm Brian Ward. I'm Dr. Andrea Lenamendi. And we are... The Arkham Sessions.